Yes, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here virtually. Uh, thank you for the introduction uh, as well. So, yes, I'm currently uh, working in Dresden as a lecturer and as a research fellow in music and AI at UCL in London, where I'm working on the project Muse AI funded by the European Research Council and led by Georgina Born. I will talk about the work I have been doing as part of this project uh, later in this talk. Um, so my work as an artist and researcher generally centers on the concept of interactive compositions. So I would like to start by introducing that concept. I define interactive compositions as musical works that involve mutual and real-time adaptation between human musicians usually playing acoustic instruments and interactive computer music systems. Interactive computer music systems are systems that are capable of uh, processing and interpreting auditory information. In other words, they're capable of listening to the human performers. And they are capable of acting both in response to human actions, but also to a certain degree independently of them as a result of autonomous algorithmic processes. So the interaction paradigm explored in my works uh, is perfectly captured in this uh, photo. Uh, in this picture, there is a musician playing an acoustic instrument on the one side of the stage and a laptop computer on the other. Importantly, what's missing from this picture is a laptop performer. So the stage disposition is evocative of a musical dialogue taking place between the musician and the computer, a musical interaction in which both the musician and the computer listen to each other and respond to each other's actions in real time. Uh, an obvious aesthetic implication of this concept, of the concept of interactive compositions, is their emphasis on interpretative multiplicity. Uh, so given that both the musician and the computer are expected to make decisions in real time and to adapt to each other's sound out output in real time. Uh, it follows that different performances of the same work can differ quite significantly from each other. And in fact, this works uh, encourage and invite unique interpretive approaches from the performers. And I am actually quite interested in how performers develop their interpretative strategies for uh, these works. So I'm, I often con conduct interviews with them to get insights into their perspective. Another important aesthetic implication of the concept of interactive compositions is that it attributes aesthetic value not only to the sonic outcome of the interaction between the musician and the computer, but also to the process of interaction per se. Um, this process is rarely limited to the oral domain. And in fact, I find that often it's more easily recognizable in the visual domain. For instance, in moments when uh, a musician picks up a certain object with the intention to perform a certain action, but then immediately puts that object down and picks up another one in response to a musical change, introduced by the computer music system. So attributing aesthetic value to interaction as a process or to the process of interaction really means understanding musical performance in non-reductionist terms, understanding musical performance as a multi-sensory lived experience. And this is also the reason why I generally prefer to document performances of my pieces in the form of video recordings rather than audio recordings. Uh, in addition to the process of, it, of interaction, my compositional approach also aestheticizes the sociosonic domain. 
I'm using the term sociosonic here to refer to social relations, for instance, human-human, but also human technology relations materialize in and through sound. So the aesthetic of my music lies as much in sound, as much in the sonic domain as it does in the social relations. It materializes and is embedded within, for instance, the composer-performer relationship. Um, finally, I would say that my compositional approach is part of a long tradition of compositional approaches that aim to destabilize the composition performance and composition improvisation binaries. And in fact, in the context of the work I will describe today, it makes much more sense to conceptualize uh, composition and improvisation as the two ends of a continuum rather than as a binary, as two mutually exclusive alternatives. So the first uh, example of an interactive composition that I would like to discuss today is Imitation Game, uh, which is a composition for human and robotic percussionist. Uh, the robotic percussionist in Imitation Game uh, incorporates a machine learning algorithm, a neural network that performs a quite straightforward uh, task. It just recognizes different instruments and playing techniques used by the human percussionist. Uh, concretely, the musician's live audio input is analyzed. Certain uh, spectral descriptors are extracted from it and then fed into the neural network which outputs an instrument and playing technique label. Uh, so here the neural network performs a multi-class classification task involving a total of 11 classes, whereby each class is a unique combination of instrument and playing technique. So class one is bongo stroke, class two is bongo scraping, class three is cowbell stroke, class four is cowbell scraping, and so on. So based on this basic recognition, the robotic percussionist then calculates some metrics of musical contrast, uh, which are rhythmic, timbral, and dynamic contrast. These metrics are calculated on a phrase basis, and based on their evolution in time, the robotic percussionist then chooses among three different behaviors or three different interaction scenarios. Uh, imitate, initiate, and repeat. Imitate involves uh, playing a musical phrase that imitates, that is similar to the musical phrase just played by the human percussionist. Initiate involves playing a musical phrase that is different and somehow contrasting to the musical phrase, phrase just played by the human percussionist. Repeat involves improvising while selectively repeating some of the human percussionist's uh, actions. As I already mentioned, uh, the decision among these three interaction scenarios is based on the evolution of musical contrast over time uh, and is driven by the objective to prevent the interaction from becoming too monotonous. So, uh, for instance, if the musician has been playing the bongos for a while, which means that timbral contrast um, has been rather low for a while, then the robotic percussionist is less likely to imitate the musician to play something similar and more likely to initiate a musical change, uh, for instance, by playing the cowbells or cymbals instead. This next slide shows a page from the score uh, of this piece. And this particular page consists of some composed musical phrases, which are organized in three concentric rectangles. Um, as we move from the center outwards here, uh, rhythmic, timbral, and dynamic contrast uh, decrease. 
In the upper third of the page, there's a stronger emphasis on strokes. And in the lower third of the page, there is a stronger emphasis on scraping. So the sound material is organized topologically here in order to enable uh, the musician to locate material fast and to make decisions in real time. Here's another page from the score, which uh, looks quite uh, different. So this page consists of some um, partially notated musical actions with uh, variable or open instrumentation and open duration. So in this scenario, in repeat, uh, the musician is instructed to improvise on these actions uh, and while, of course, interacting with the robotic percussionist. Uh, the video I'm going to play next um, shows an instance of this scenario, repeat, in which the, the robotic percussionist improvises while selectively repeating some of the human percussionist's actions. This is a performance by Manuel Alcaraz Clemente. Great, so moving on. Uh, so the next piece that I would like to discuss today uh, is called Bias, and it's a piece for bass clarinet and interactive music system. Um, this piece takes uh, a drastically different approach to machine learning and explores computational aesthetic evaluation and AI or algorithmic bias. AI bias is a phenomenon that consists in machine learning algorithms either making um, wrong arbitrary assumptions about data or amplifying and echoing human bias that is already present in the data. So for this piece, I actually trained two neural networks to simulate my own subjective aesthetic preferences. Uh, in order to do that, I collaborated with clarinetist Sillard Benes. I asked him to improvise, recorded these improvisation sessions, then segmented the audio recordings and labeled, evaluated the resulting audio excerpts uh, based on my subjective aesthetic preferences. So for the evaluation, I used a scale from one to five with one end corresponding to extremely interesting and the other end corresponding to not at all interesting. So I just labeled these audio excerpts and then used them as training examples for two separate neural networks. Uh, one performing an aesthetic evaluation on a sound event basis on its individual sound and the other on longer segments of audio, essentially on musical phrases or textures. Uh, so during a performance of this piece, uh, the interactive music system performs an aesthetic evaluation of the musician's live input. So this all happens in real time. 
and then responds by imitating sounds and textures it finds interesting, but remains silent or even proposes new and different sound material when it loses interest in the musician's input. Uh, the computer music system also collects its own sound material during its interactions with different musicians. Um, so during different rehearsals and performances of this piece, the computer stores the spectral analysis of sounds it finds interesting in a continu continuously expanding database. And it then retrieves the analysis data from the database in order to resynthesize uh, the, the sounds uh, in varying degrees of recognizability. Uh, now, obviously, this means that none of the electronic sounds heard in this work were composed or even curated by me. They were just collected autonomously by the computer music system based on its own aesthetic preferences. This also means that each time that a performer rehearses or performs this piece, they are both interacting with and contributing to this uh, collectively assembled sound corpus. Um, here is a page from the score of the piece, which also consists of some partially notated musical actions, uh, which can be performed in any order, any number of times, and in many variations. So for instance, this action right here consists of transitioning from an air tone to half air tone, half multiphonic, back to an air tone, and so on repeatedly. Um, there are no fingering or pitch indications here, meaning that the performer is free to choose any multiphonic that can be performed at the indicated dynamic, which in this particular case is pianissimo. The duration indication for this musical action is four breaths. Uh, bias obviously attempts to draw a parallelism between aesthetic judgments as inherently subjective and therefore biased and the phenomenon of AI or algorithmic bias. The piece also attempts a reductio ad absurdum, a reduction to absurdity of computational aesthetic evaluation. So the piece essentially questions whether it's possible to trace and model simulate aesthetic judgments. And indeed, the data collection process for this project uh, very much reflected the absurdity of the task. So for instance, how do you evaluate a sound, an individual sound out of any other context? Or how do you evaluate a sound such as an air tone after having listened to similar sounds to other air tones for half an hour? Uh, finally, the piece takes a critical and subversive approach to machine learning. So the purpose of machine learning in this piece is really not to simulate my own aesthetic judgments as accurately as possible, but rather to use them as a starting point for the development of AI and algorithmic bias and explore this specific idiosyncratic property of machine learning algorithms. So what I was interested in in this piece where all the different ways in which the neural networks would distort and misinterpret my own uh, aesthetic judgments. Uh, indeed, the neural networks uh, did seem to develop some very clear biases. So for instance, they seemed to prefer um, low frequency sounds over high frequency ones and slowly evolving drone-like textures over uh, virtuosic melodic passages, for instance. I would say that these are generally plausible assumptions about my own aesthetic preferences, but they are also quite exaggerated and oversimplified. Uh, in the video I'm going to play next, uh, the clarinetist explores some percussive sounds. The interactive music system initially responds to him, but quickly loses interest in that type of sound material and proposes some drones instead. Uh, I should note at this point that uh, you should probably listen to this with headphones on because of 
um, the low frequencies involved because laptop speakers might not uh, really be uh, that good at playing back these frequencies. So here is an excerpt from a performance by uh, Sillard Venice. So this was bias performed by Sillard Venice. Uh, the next piece I would like to discuss was composed as part of the Muse AI research project uh, or music and artificial intelligence building critical interdisciplinary studies and specifically the work packets permeable interdisciplinarity, algorithmic composition subverted. Um, so as part of this work package, composer Aaron Einbond and I both composed pieces for acoustic instruments and live electronics, incorporating machine learning, and used autoethnography to trace and reflect on the compositional process. Um, so the title of the work I composed as part of this project is Bias 2, uh, and it's written for piano and interactive music system. Uh, the photo you see on the screen right now was taken by the uh, project leader Georgina Bourne during a rehearsal with Xenia Pestova, Bennett, 
in October 2022 in London. Uh, so the score of this piece consists of seven clusters, seven groups of timbrally similar musical actions. These musical actions involve primarily inside piano playing techniques and string preparations. Just to give you an idea of the different timbres explored in this composition, here are a few examples. So hopefully this gives you an idea. Uh, so then in this piece, the pianist, is, the pianist is free to transition between any of these actions and any of these clusters or timbres. Uh, a machine learning algorithm called a recurrent neural network or RNN is then used to uh, model or to try to learn how performers uh, navigate this timbral topology. Uh, in other words, to learn how performers transition between these different timbres. So the data, the training data fed into this RNN are then generated by a separate machine learning algorithm, also a neural network that performs a very uh, simple classification task similar to the one in imitation game. So this algorithm simply analyzes the incoming audio and assigns it to one of the seven timbres in the score. This algorithm then creates some logs of individual performances that look something like this. So this is the analysis of a single performance of a piece. Its number in this sequence corresponds to one second of audio, one second of the performance, and represents the predominant cluster, the predominant timbre during that second. So we can see, for example, in this uh, particular performance that the pianist played some sounds from cluster four during the first three seconds of the performance, then briefly transitioned to cluster seven and then played nothing for three seconds. So here numbers from one through seven represent the seven numbers in the score and zero simply represents silence. So this data is then fed into the RNN, the recurrent neural network, which learns to generate similarly looking sequences of numbers. So the RNN essentially learns to predict the form of entire performances of the piece based on uh, data extracted from past performances. Uh, this is similar to applications of RNNs in text generation, for example, where uh, these algorithms are trained on large corpora, large text corpora, and then generate new texts um, as sequences of individual words by predicting one word at a time. So this next slide shows the information flow inside the interactive music system in BIOS 2. So starting at the very left, we have the acoustic sound, the piano sound, which is captured by a microphone and then analyzed. The spectral descriptors extracted through this analysis are then fed into the cluster recognition algorithm, the machine listening algorithm, which assigns incoming sounds to one of the seven numbers in the score. Based on the output of this cluster recognition algorithm, the interactive music system then applies different signal processing techniques to the input signal. So in other words, different numbers are processed different by the computer music system. Different um, digital transformations are applied to the input signal based on this classification performed by the machine listening algorithm. Uh, 
Of course, the output of the machine listening algorithm is also fed into the RNN, which then predicts how the performance might continue, which cluster is likely to follow next. And the RNN then plays back pre-recorded samples of the cluster it has predicted if its prediction differs from what the musician is currently doing. Uh, this happens each second of the performance. So each second of the performance, the RNN predicts how the performance might continue and plays back uh, samples based on its predictions. Uh, obviously, the predictions made by the RNN are based on data extracted from past performances of the piece. And this, of course, means that its performance of this work influences all of its future performances. So one of the main themes explored in this work is distributed creativity. Um, creativity in this piece is, of course, distributed among both human and non-human actors. So this involves the composer, the performers, and the computer music system. Um, however, creativity is also dispersed uh, in space and time. So the performer in this work is set in an explicit dialogue with the work's interpretative history, with interpretative choices made by other performers in the past. So this work could be described as what Georgina Bourne terms a provisional musical work, which both retains and blurs the traces and boundaries of individual and collective authorship. Another theme explored in this work is labor and specifically its distribution, concentration and crystallization in the form of data. I already talked a little bit about the distribution of creativity and uh, musical labor in this work. However, during the creative process, during the compositional process, labor was also concentrated uh, in the form of interdisciplinarity in one person. So rather than collaborating with a computer scientist or an engineer, uh, as part of the compositional process for this piece, I actually programmed and trained both neural networks myself. And I did that in order to uh, get a deeper insight into the architecture and inner workings of uh, the algorithms. Another aspect of this uh, work pertaining to labor is the crystallization of the performer's labor in the form of training data. Um, so in this piece, the performer's interpretative choices are recorded and crystallized in the form of training data, which are then used to train the RNN, effectively driving the behavior of the computer music system. And this, of course, raises some interesting questions regarding the composer-performer relationship in this piece. Um, I should note at this point that Traditionally, in Western art music, the composer-performer relationship has generally been a hierarchical and asymmetrical one. And there have been cases in which the performer's labor uh, was arguably exploited by the composer. So this is, for me, a very interesting but also very complex topic. And as far as, as, far as the topic of labor is concerned, I am particularly interested in the performer's perspective on this, uh, which is why I have contacted interviews with both pianists who have performed this piece so far, uh, Magda Mayas and Ksenia Pestova Bennett. And I am, of course, planning to continue to conduct interviews with other performers who will perform this piece in the future. Um, finally, another theme explored in this work are critical insights into AI and machine learning gained specifically through artistic research, through practice-led research. And what emerged as the main critical insight into AI and machine learning uh, in this work concerned the contingency of data on the human decisions and material conditions involved 
in the data collection process or the data creation process. Um, so one of the main sources of unpredictability and complexity in the behavior of the computer music system turned out to be the very simple classification errors made by the machine listening algorithm, the cluster recognition algorithm. So this neural network would misidentify certain numbers, then causing the RNN, the recurrent neural network, to forge false associations between various numbers. Um, of course, these classification errors are attributable to um, a variety of factors involved in the data creation process and ranging from human decisions to the material properties of the audio equipment used to record the training examples. So for instance, the microphones I used to record the training examples seem to play a very important role and seem to strongly influence what this neural network, this cluster recognition algorithm learned. Um, for example, after recording examples with a single microphone and then testing the trained model, I realized that it was actually performing very well when it was tested using the same microphone I had used uh, to record the training examples, but it was actually performing quite poorly when it was tested using a different microphone. So this model had learned something very specific to the microphone I had used in the data collection process. Um, this happens very often in machine learning and the machine learning ter term for, for that is overfitting. The technical solution to this problem um, would simply be to record more examples using a variety of different microphones in order to improve the algorithm's ability to generalize, that's the machine learning term, on previously unseen examples. However, even after I recorded examples with a large number of uh, different microphones with different characteristics, um, as well as a total of three different pianos, this cluster recognition algorithm still made mistakes that I could easily attribute to the training data. So far from being uh, the exception or a rare occurrence, this tendency to overfit the data actually seems to be uh, an inherent property of these uh, algorithms. Another factor that seemed to uh, strongly influence what this machine listening algorithm learned in BIOS 2 uh, were the various decisions involved in the data collection process. For instance, the decision to only record uh, examples of one timbre at a time rather than superimpose more than one timbres in the same recording. This, of course, led to the machine listening algorithm being completely confused when pianists actually did uh, superimpose multiple timbres during the performance. Uh, so while in computer science and in engineering, data are generally portrayed as being neutral, collectible entities, this research really demonstrated that data are neither neutral nor natural, but they are actually contingent on the human decisions and the material conditions involved in the data collection process. Uh, so along with um, R9 Bond and Georgina Bourne, we recently submitted um, a paper describing uh, Aaron's and my work as part of this project, my contribution to which consisted in connecting the work I just described to theoretical frameworks from the field of critical data studies and exploring how artistic research in particular can provide critical insights into AI and machine learning. Uh, so for the remaining time of my talk, I would just like to play a brief excerpt uh, from the premiere of Bias 2 by Magda Mayas at ZKM in Karlsruhe. And with that, I would like to conclude my talk. Hopefully this gave you some insight into my work. 
And if you have any questions about uh, specific aspects of these pieces or my work as an artist and researcher in general, I'd be uh, more than happy to answer them.